morning, everyone. I give you warm greetings and welcome to this service of the Feast of Tabernacles. And as Mr. Trent mentioned earlier, we are halfway through the feast. This is the fourth day, of course, of the full eight days, including the last great day. What do you think is the world's best kept secret? There's a lot of them. For instance, uh, Jimmy Hoffa disappeared. No one ever found his remains. Someone knows where that body ended up. It may be in hamburger uh, uh, <laughs> texture, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, they never found Jimmy Hoffa. I live very near a city there in uh, Upper East Tennessee, or East Tennessee, Oak Ridge. One of the best kept secrets during uh, the beginning of the ending, rather, of World War II, where they put together this very complex A-bomb at the time, I guess, and they worked on it under great secrecy. Had signs around, zip your lip, and all that type thing. One of the best kept secrets of the entire war. In fact, brought it to a clear ending, which I applauded, because I think it had to be ended. It saved lives, actually. Some will argue that point. Well, anyway, believe it or not, I could refer to a lot of things. I'm referring to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The world best kept secret. Now, how do I put that together? Let's turn to Matthew, the 13th chapter, to begin with. And we'll begin reading, first of all, in verse 16. Now, we here in this congregation are beginning to understand who we really are. The called out ones, the ecclesia, the unique, we were called there in a very fine sermonette. We have understanding that surpasses anything that you could ever learn here in this world. I don't care how much education you have, I don't know how, how many degrees you have after your name, you would not get what we know without this extra measure that God has gone to to ensure that we do understand. And I do believe he has something for us to learn this particular feast. I've noticed there is a, a joining together of the minds of the speakers who have been up here thus far, and there seems like there's a common thread flowing here that I hope to continue today. Mr. Smith had a bad time with his voice the other day, and he sort of jokingly, halfway I hope, that maybe I could come up and finish his sermon well, believe it or not, the notes that I have had for weeks, and he's had his for weeks, and we don't communicate as ministers or deacons what we're going to speak on. We usually let uh, get the passing of Mr. Trent, maybe look it over and see if we're in line with everything, and we always are. But anyway, Matthew 13, we'll begin reading in verse 16. This is speaking about you folks. This is speaking about us and this congregation who are a part of the very body of Jesus Christ. He says, blessed are your eyes. Now then, I'm wearing glasses, but they're still blessed that I have the availability of it. But it's talking about in the spiritual sense, of course. Blessed are your eyes, for they see. Remember the scripture there, and we'll read it a little later on. For you see your calling, brethren. You understand it. You see what it's about. You perceive it. It's talking about spiritual seeing it. And your ears, for they hear. And I'm glad we have the amplification worked out now after the little glitch there at the beginning. But we have ears. They hear, but they hear the truth. They're able to discern truth from error. For truly I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men People who lived according to God's way of life, kept His commandments. Righteous men have desired to see those things which you see. This little group of people, 50, 60, 70 people, gathered here together in Lexington and other parts of the United States and uh, even out of the country. Other groups are keeping this Feast of Tabernacles. Hopefully, they have the level of understanding that we have. That's what we desire. We're disjointed right now, but eventually could, we'll come together in God's kingdom. They've desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them, to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. 
I don't care who you would have invited of your worldly friends into this meeting. If he were sitting here among us, unless God had opened his mind, had given him a calling, he would not know what we're talking about. And I find this is one of the points of the common theme that has occurred in this feast. The calling. Hear you therefore the parable of the sower. Then he had to explain that to his disciples. Then Christ proceeds to give several parables here following this to his disciples and to reveal to them, and I capitalize these words, to them what these parables meant. So moving on down to verse 34 in the same chapter, Matthew 13. All these things, he was telling them all these parables, spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables or proverbs or things hard to be understood. And without a parables, talking to, about the multitudes, spake he not unto them. So they still don't get it. Two thousand years later, they still don't get it unless he opens that mind through a miracle. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will uh, utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Notice, things that have been kept Secret. It's a secret. It's called a mystery, as we'll read a little later on. Going on, we'll read in um, verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away, the large group there, and went into the house, and his disciples, his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us. And that's what I'm doing here today to you. I'm declaring unto you the truths of God with the help of God Almighty through the Holy Spirit, of course. Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. Let's go now to the book of Romans. And we'll pick up some other scriptures in Romans 16. Romans 16 and in verse 25. 16 and verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you or establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, the real Jesus Christ. Oh, you can hear the, the mouth mouthing of the name Jesus Christ every Sunday morning, just a a plethora of programs that are preaching Christ, but not the real Christ, not the real Jesus Christ, according to the revelation, has to be something revealed, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, reiterating what we just read in Matthew. So they're in unison in what they think and know and believe. Verse 26 says, But now is made manifest or made clear by the Scriptures of the prophets. Yes, we understand what's going to take place and how the kingdom of God is going to be established and those things by the Scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God. God intended it, but He's kept it secret from the world at large made known, now notice this, made known to all nations, but not yet. It will be known to, uh, made known to all nations, as Mr. Trent brought out so well about the Gentiles, when they're going to be brought into the knowledge of the truth of God, and things like that. And I, like I say, all these things have fit together during this, during this feast. For the obedience of faith, yes, they'll have to come to that place, to willing to be obedient, to come up and keep the Feast of Tabernacles and keep all of God's commandments, and faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. They're going to learn what we are learning even today. And that's what I'm trying to teach you today. First, did I read? Yes, 26. It's going to be made known to all, but not at the same time. 
So it is going to be revealed, and it's only revealed at this time to those who have been drawn by God. We've uh, quoted this scripture several times during this feast. John six forty four. Christ himself said, and Mr. Uh, Stephen brought this out very plainly. You must be called of God. No man can come to me, the real Jesus Christ, except the Father which has sent me. Draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. The first resurrection. Call to this special resurrection. Also, we're called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We read about that in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verse 26, beginning with that. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise, not many noble, not many mighty are called at this time. I'm not adding to the Scripture, but it just has to be that way. We're granted repentance, it tells us in Romans 2 and 4. you want to read this later. I've got so many, I don't want to try to read all of them, but look these things up. We're granted repentance by the goodness of God. Know ye not that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. You think you came to this group or this understanding on your own? You did not. It was a secret kept from you until God decided, looking around, He said, He seeks those who will be willing to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And He's seeking those kind of people. You find that in Romans 2, 4, that He grants us repentance. And we get, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit Through that repentance and acceptance of Jesus Christ as Savior, we have undergo water baptism, burying of the old self. We read about that in Acts 2.38, which we are all very familiar with this, or else we would never have been baptized into the church in the the first place. And then we read about that it must be through the laying on of hands by the ministry. They were asked, well, we'll turn to this one, Acts 19. Let's turn back to pretty close here. Acts 19, and we'll read, um, let's see if I can find it here. This uh, podium is a bit crowded, but Acts 19, verse 6, excuse me. Verse 6. We could start reading two or three verses ahead of this. Verse 2. Let's start in verse 2 to get a, a more clear feeling for it. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Spirit? should be a Holy Spirit, of course. Since you believed. Yeah, that's part of it. And they said unto him, We've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit correctly. They hadn't even heard about this. And he said unto them, Well, unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism, which was a baptism unto repentance. You read in other scriptures. Then said Paul, O John truly baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come. Remember he said he would not be worthy to even tie his shoes. Speaking of Jesus Christ, that is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, they didn't even know about the Holy Spirit. So they did not yet have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in this particular incident. Yes, there are other places where the Holy Spirit was granted before baptism. For instance, Cornelius' house, the beginning of the calling of some Gentiles. But in this particular incident, they had to have hands laid on them. So don't get that confused in the script. Well, it says this and says that. Use the mind of God that says we should have the mind of Jesus Christ. When He laid His hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and then they spoke with tongues or languages and prophesied, even began to speak with inspiration, just like they did there in Acts 2.38 on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was first given. And all the men were about twelve at that particular time. All right. All these things that we've read about here, the repentance, acceptance of Jesus Christ, being baptized, and having hand laid upon you, are absolutely 
necessary. That's all a part of the salvational process. And it is, has been brought up before, that it is a process. We're not yet perfect, as brought up by the sermonette. Of course we're not perfect yet. We're still human beings. And I can say amen to that. And this is absolutely necessary before human beings can have their eyes and their ears, that we read in the opening scriptures there, open to this secret. Now there are other instances that gives us things about this secret. Go back to the book of Daniel. Daniel 2. And we'll read... Um, Oh, this is going to be difficult, but we'll turn it sideways or something here. Daniel 2, and we'll read in verse 26. There are other places in the Bible that talks about God having secrets. And, excuse me, the way that He reveals them and to whom He reveals them. Verse um, 26, remember this king of Babylon had a dream there. And this is talking about that great image. We've seen that in many of our publications down through the years. And he was to be this head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar. Then you come on down to a lesser of value, but a little stronger to the silver, the, the breast and the arms of silver and going on down. But verse 26, the king sent for this uh, Daniel, which brought in haste, he tells us in 25. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name, whose name was Belteshazzar, Daniel's name, are you able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and soothsayers show unto the king. It's a secret, he said. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. We're the product of this right here in this modern time. And makes known unto the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days even. It has a, uh, a meaning to us. This last part of this image, which will be the toes forming right now in Europe, as we have heard many times. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. And then he explained this vision that this king had seen, going all the way down from him, from Babylon there, being the king of the head of gold, down to our very days in which we're living, and rapidly forming into the toes now. And when Jesus Christ returns, we know that it will strike the image on the toes, not on the head, not on the breast, not on the torso, not on the legs, on the toes. That's when the return of Jesus Christ occurs then. There's another instance there in Genesis 40. We could turn over there and read this. And there was another man of the Bible, a great one of our forebears, in fact. Genesis 40. We can read uh, in verse um, 8. They said unto him, Now these two men had been thrown into prison. It was two of the household servants of the king there. And one was a baker, and I believe, and I forgot the other what he was. But they had been thrown into prison because they had offended the king. They said unto him, We've dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph, our forefather, we believe, the English-speaking people of the world, said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God again? Tell me them, I pray you. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me. So then Joseph went, uh, they brought it to Joseph, and Joseph told them in verse 12, This is the interpretation of it, the three branches of three days and all that, and what would happen to each one of them. What his dream meant. Now, we're not big in uh, interpreting dreams or anything any longer. No one has ever asked me to interpret a dream, and I wouldn't want him to because I wouldn't know how to do it. I do not have that gift. But Joseph did, and so did Daniel. And there are others in the Bible who have these. And some of the prophets had uh, knowledge of dreams and interpretations of it. So there's far more than to understanding the true meaning of the secrets, or sometimes called mysteries, of God than just, as they say in the religious world or even in the Protestant world and things like that, just giving your heart to the Lord. 
Now that's part of it, but a, just the beginning part of it. Christ our Passover is the beginning part of salvation, but it's more than just giving your heart to the Lord or some other uh, smarmy. Mr. Garner Ted Armstrong used to use that expression, means sweet and uh, sanguine, or that word, or accepting the name of Jesus Christ. There's much more to it than that. Now, this world, including those of the so called Christian persuasion, from Catholic on down through the Protestant world and all that, have been taught and believes that this is the only day of salvation uh, for mankind. This may shock you, but let's go back to the New Testament now and see why this came about. We'll go to... Um, let's see where we're going to go here. Well, we first could just quote you this. Revelation 12.9 tells us that Satan, the great dragon, was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. So we have to lay down this as a uh, background or footnote, I guess, to find out who is the deceiver and how did it happen. All right, He was cast out into the earth and his angels, his demons, who became demons, were cast out with him. Remember, he drew about a third of them in his attempt to overthrow the very throne of God Almighty. Well, Christ said he saw him come, come smashing back as lightning. It didn't take God long to dispose of him with the power that he possesses he would never have been able to do that, but he did create a lot of havoc and destruction to this universe. And we may have the opportunity, under God the Father and under God the Son and others, David and those who will have become a part of the kingdom of God, to help restore this. So Christ is there now. He's planning on the restoration of all things. And he's going to come back and commence it on the earth first. But anyway, it says he's deceived the whole world and... Uh, you can read about his disposal in Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 15, and Ezekiel 28. I can remember them somewhat because one is double. 14th chapter of Isaiah, 28th chapter of Ezekiel. I use those little things to help this older mind remember. Ezekiel 28, you can read about that. He's referred to as a human king, a type. The king of uh, Tyrus and things like that. But it's actually talking about Satan because it says, Thou wast perfect until iniquity was found in them. No human being has ever been perfect except Jesus Christ. None of us are perfect. But anyway, he had uh, he addressed this to this king who had this great vanity and things like that, and he talked to him through this king or as a type. But anyway, Satan fell from his high position, probably the highest uh, being in the uh, God kingdom, I guess you could call it, one of the highest uh, angels ever created among three cherub angels. Now, most of the deceptions I was going to tell you there a while ago comes from, from uh, certain passages uh, promulgated by the false ministers of Satan, and it tells us in Corinthians that he does have a ministry. 1 Corinthians 11 and... 2 Corinthians 4, I guess it is. But let's go to 2 Corinthians 6 for the first Scripture. 2 Corinthians, Corinthians 6. We'll read this. Now, here's where they get their ideas. And a lot of these so-called um, evangelical ministers and some of the ones who write articles in newspapers about my answer and things like that, they think if they cannot coerce or beg or plead with humanity at this time, if they don't accept that name of Jesus Christ, at this time, all hope is lost. They do not know about the plan of God. That He comes in stages. About They don't know about the three resurrections. They could learn about that from our Bible correspondence course presented by Mr. Trent and other literature that we produce. But without the help of God's Spirit and the calling, they're not even going to understand that. But first... 2 Corinthians 6, 2, it tells us this. For he saith, I have heard thee and a time accepted. So that sort of nails it down to a time, doesn't it? And the day of salvation have I succored or helped thee. And now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. 
And they use this scripture as the base of that belief that unless you're called and accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and gone through the rituals that they may present, and some of them are different than what, some of them are similar to what we have. Water baptism, submerging as a type of burial and all that. So this seemed, just superficially reading, it seems to bear out what most believe, if you just read that. But you have to know. If you'll notice in your marginal references here, you'll find that this is a quote from the Old Testament. Now, how does it read? Well, let's go Isaiah 49. Um, We'll turn back there. It's just one verse. But notice it reads differently. Isaiah 49 and in verse 8. Now, here's the way it's... uh, tells it. Thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time. It doesn't just say specifically a, but an. So it gives you some leeway there. And yes, there is. Because there's a different group of people at different times that God's dealing with. In an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation. Yes, there is a day of salvation for everybody, but I'm going to explain to it Bring it to you in one simple statement. Have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee, and give thee for a covenant to the people to establish the earth to cause to inherit the desolate heritages. Now then, I'm going to read this to you twice. It's so simple, but I want to bear this on your mind. There is a day of salvation for everyone at some time. Yes, there is a day of salvation for everyone at some time. But you have to know the plan of God to find out when that is. But it is not the only day for all. Now, I concluded this from various scriptures that I researched, and it's a true saying. It's not the only day for all at the same time. I hope I can impress that on your minds because you'll run into people who will try to argue that if you do not accept Jesus Christ now in this era and at this time, you're lost. That's the end of you because they don't know about the second resurrection. They don't know about salvation being offered beyond the grave. As it tells us in Ezekiel, what, 37? But again, you have to have the Holy Spirit guiding your mind. But the great Creator God, as we know, and we've heard about this all through these sermons, and you tie them together, and they intermesh or interlock together. I've been noticing this trend during this whole feast. He has a plan of which we are aware of, of which the vast majority has not had revealed to them at this time. Pure and simple. Now, people of little or no understanding, now I can't say they're ignorant, but they're ignorant of the truth. They're ignorant of the facts. They're ignorant of the plan of God. It does not make them diminished in intellectuality from one John Shelton, because I'm no paragon or of knowledge and uh, mind power. I just have never been that way. Check my old school grades and you'll see. I never would have amounted to anything except what God is going to help me to achieve. Romans 10. Here's another scripture they use, trying to prove this point. Oh, if you don't believe on Jesus Christ now, doomed to hell, and that hell is different from the hells we understand. The wages of sin is death. Death by being cremated cremated in the lake of fire. But they have this eternal suffering and torturing torment through all eternity for the ones who are going to the hellfire they believe in is totally different. Totally different. They like to quote Romans 10 and verse 9. If you shall confess or shall confess with your mouth, it looks pure and simple, doesn't it? And it is. The Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God raised him up, raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. 
Is that all of it? Afraid not. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Yes, that's a vital part of it. That's a vital part of it. This statement is true because it is from God's Word. But is this all there is to the process of salvation? And we've heard this included in some of the sermonettes and the sermon about the plan of God, of course, and it is a process. But I'm afraid that Satan's deception of the whole world is very much in action because we read there in Matthew 19 that the ma the mass the vast majority do not understand what I'm telling you today. And, um, in fact, another point of truth, this young man came to Christ and said, what can I do? So there was some action he had to take. What may I do, what can I do that I may have eternal life? Now, he wasn't speaking about this human existence, which goes on for a while and it's soon gone. He was talking about salvation. What may I do to have eternal life? Now, ask him that question in Matthew 19. What did Christ respond to him? Well, he said, well, there's none, he referred to him as being good. He said, there's none good but God. But if you will enter into life, and we're using the eternal life here, keep the commandments. So do we have to keep the commandments of God? That's what Jesus Christ said. And also in 1 John 2, 4, we'll not turn there, but it says, he that saith, I know him. And you know what that expression is. Do you know the Lord, brother? Have you ever heard that in your unconverted days and people would come to you trying to get an entrance into your house and preach these false doctrines? Do you know the Lord? Well, I didn't. I didn't know what it meant. But that's what it means. If you say that you know the Lord and keep not His commandments, God says, not me, you are a liar and the truth is not in you. So don't try to deceive me when you say, well, I know the Lord. I said, well, do you keep His commandments? Oh, yes, I love the commandments. I said, how about the fourth one? Well, yes, I believe it. What is the fourth one? <laughs> well, when you tell them it's the seventh day Sabbath, then the, the conversation begins to kind of drag. But going on, these are Scriptures, just a few. You must come to a far, far greater and deeper understanding of God's Word and the magnitude of what salvation is all about before you can reach this goal. Let's go to Revelation uh, 21. This is the goal that we're trying to achieve. And you're going to have to go a whole lot farther than just saying, oh yes, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not going to get it. Verse 7 of Revelation 21. He that overcometh, so you have to overcome. What? Overcome the carnal self? Overcome the vanity and the carnality that's in you? He that overcometh shall inherit all things. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. How many times during this feast have we heard brought out the fact that we are to become literal, born again sons of God? First in the... Um, begotten state, and we've heard these things and studied them, looked them up, that ganao can mean either begotten or born, and you have to differentiate between the two in the context. We're not yet born of God, folks. We are begotten, as Mr. Armstrong, I believe, put it 35 or 40 years ago. This is not something new. We're in the embryonic state of becoming God. That's what the Bible clearly teaches, what Mr. Smith was giving in his... Uh, Sermon. Going on then. He shall be my son. Now how do you become a son of God except being born? And it was explained uh, to this person. We'll get into that. Did you know and understand that Jesus Christ is the firstborn among these children? Let's go back to the book of Romans, the 8th chapter. One of my favorite uh, chapters. Because it makes it very plain that if you don't have the Spirit of God, you're not going to be in the kingdom of God ever, either in this at this time or ever. You must have that Spirit of God. Romans 8 and verse 28. 
Let me see if I've got the right verse down. Yes. We know that all things work together for good, and I've got that little uh, thing, I believe it belongs to my wife, on our mantle at home, and I read it often. They don't quote you all of it, just part of it. <laughs> we know that all things work together for good to those in that love God, and then they stop it. But, you have to go on to the next part of the same verse to understand what it's saying. To them who are the called, yes, this select group, this unique group, are called of God according to His purpose, according to His plan. For whom He did foreknow, yes, He had this all planned out. He foreknew what He was going to do, whom He was going to call, about the number He was going to call, and He was looking for certain type individuals, and He's called us, brethren. I hope you understand the magnificence of our calling. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate. That's where the predestination comes in. Not by each individual name. Or He would have had to mess with the genealogies of every family since Adam and Eve. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. Hebrews tells us that Christ the Son is the express image of the Father. So it goes right back to the family of God. That He, Jesus Christ, might be the firstborn among many brethren and sisters, sons and daughters. Now how that will be in the kingdom, I do not fully understand uh, the genders and things like that. God has that worked out. Now then in Hebrews 8, let's see. Yes, Hebrews 8 has this to say. Verse 10. For it became Him, that's Jesus Christ, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, we have learned through the help of the Holy Spirit and being in God's church, that He is the Creator of all things. Jesus Christ, that is. By whom are all things, and that word, that expression means the universe. Everything that was made that is made, this includes our inheritance, folks. By whom are all things, and bringing, he's going to be the agent, bringing many sons unto glory. That glorified state that we're all seeking for and looking for. To make the captain of their salvation... Perfect through sufferings, and he certainly did suffer. Verse 11, for both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified, set apart to become a member, a part of the family of God, are all of one. All of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. We don't go around boasting that Jesus Christ is our brother, but that's what the scriptures say. He is not ashamed to call us His brethren, a part of the begotten family of God. He's the firstborn. We've not been born yet. Ephesians 3 tells us that God, very plainly, is a family. Why do you think there's... By the way, there's a movement afoot now that they're going to try to do away with all the gender in the Bible. I've forgotten which group it is. A lot of ladies are leading the movement, I think. But they're going to do away with the he's and the hers or whatever. And just it's going to be an it. And it's going to be in this uh, NIV Bible. I think the next translation about 2012, it should be out. And they're pressing for this that no gender. You tell me how a woman can beget a son or a child. Is that possible? Not even in the physical sense. And how can a man bear a child? Oh, yes, we heard the Scripture about a man having his hands on his loins, going to give birth. Yes, but a man does not give birth. And, but he begets, and the female part then bears the child, being a type of the church. But they're going to try to do away with that. But in Ephesians 3 and uh, verse 14, Ephesians 3. 
For this cause, I bow my knees, yes, and we had better be bowing our knees, unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how are you going to do away with the gender here? The Father of a Son. It's another movement of Satan's perverted attempt to overthrow the plan of God or to dis distort and confuse. That's what he's the author of confusion. God is not. I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom, now notice this, the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Yes, it is a family, exactly as Mr. Smith was bringing out in his sermon. And we, we do not correspond about, what are you going to talk about? No, we don't do that. We get on our knees and say, Father, lead me in what uh, you want your people to hear, what they need to hear. But it, it's called a family here of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Now this is what uh, Christ is explaining to Nicodemus there in John 3. Let's go back there. And verse 3. And this uh, a ruler, uh, an educated, highly regarded man, his name was Nicodemus, and he came to the, uh, Jesus Christ, and he said, Rabbi, we know they knew more than they uh, expressed a lot of times. We know that you are a teacher come from God. Quite a statement. For no man can do these miracles which you do, except God be with him. And Jesus answered and said unto him, well, Truly, truly, I say unto you, now he's going to give him a lesson. The man didn't get it, but he still gave this lesson. Except a man or a woman, be born again, or my margin says born from above. You can use either one, but born again. You've already been born once, so I think that is a better way of expressing it. He cannot see. He cannot see the kingdom of God. So, he cannot understand what it's all about, actually. And then Nicodemus said unto him, he thought about a human birth. He knew he was talking about a literal birth but not on the physical plane. That's all he could understand. But it's a spiritual plane. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? He understood what Christ was talking about as far as the physical mind can comprehend. But this was not a physical expression. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man be born of water, a type of baptism, and also a type of the physical birth where the child is in the... Of the water sack. And of the Spirit. He's got to be born of the Spirit, he's telling him. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. We'll read other corresponding scriptures on that. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's what every one of us are in this room. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. He did not say spiritual. No, would you begin to talk in religious jargon and those type things. It makes you look and sound religious. You are going to become spirit. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. I hope you get that. Mr. Armstrong explained it very well. He said, take the, the pen test. He said, take a pen and stick it in your skin and see if you flinch or it hurts. He said, you're not born again if, you, if it hurts. You're still in the flesh. Very simple explanation. And it talks about how you will be when you're born again. The wind blows where it lists or wants to go. And you hear the sound thereof, but you can't see it. You don't see the wind unless it's got dust and debris picked up in it. But the wind of them by itself is invisible. You hear the sound thereof, but you can't tell from whence it cometh and whether it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Remember the Scripture talks about the way we'll be able to uh, take, uh, judge and direct people's actions. It says well, you start to go to the right or the left, these human beings that are still on the planet, not yet changed, a voice comes from behind them that will be our voice, saying, here's the way, here's the way, walk you in it. Walk you in this way of life, this book. So yes, we'll be invisible when we want to be invisible. I know they... <laughs> Uh, some of the kids are getting kind of aggravated because the parents want to 
listen in on their uh, website or whatever it is, uh, Facebook and those type of things that I can't even comprehend, frankly. But I'll read about it, marvel at it. But anyway, you must be born again, and when you are, you will become a spirit being. All right. I'll just read you this because we were there, and I should have read it while I was there. But Romans 8, and in verse 11, I'll read this from my notes. Now, notice this, the necessity of the Holy Spirit, the absolute vital necessity. But if, if, that big word if, the Spirit of Him, capital H, that's God being, that raised up Jesus, who was that? That was God the Father, from the dead, if it dwell in you, dwell in you, not just be working with you, but dwell in you that Christ promised there uh, on the event of His crucifixion when He was talking to His disciples. He said it will dwell in you. He that raised up Christ, again the Father, from the dead, shall also quicken or make alive your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwells in you. Now let's go to the uh, what we call the uh, resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15. And I'll have to check on my time there in a moment. I don't know whether that time counted on my losing the speaker device or not. Okay, that looks pretty good. I believe I'm in the guidelines of these sermons. Finally. Oh, yeah. We do need reining in because sometimes we have so much material working in our minds and we want to present it that we do get uh, ahead of ourselves sometimes. But going on to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 42, it tells us about this process that is going to take place. talks about the resurrection of the dead. Verse 42, It is sown in corruption. Yes, it will decay and go right back to the earth from whence it came. It's raised in incorruption. No longer will it rot or decay in any way. It's forever to remain that state now. It is sown in dishonor. No, I don't have a whole lot of honor going for me. Never have been a high-ranking person in any field. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. We can't imagine what that's like to feel our bodies rise in the air like lights, as Mr. Smith brought out one in one of his uh, recorded sermons, like lights coming up from that grave or wherever you're buried. Maybe you're etched in concrete in uh, Hiroshima or something like that. I don't think there was any Christians there, but God knows where you are, whether you're in the sea, whether you're in the grave, wherever you are, He can call you from a resurrection. Going on. It's sown in, raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. Yes. It's raised in power. Power. It's sown a natural body. That's what we all are. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul or a living being. The last Adam, speaking of Christ, was made a quickening spirit. However, that uh, was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. And the first man, of course, Adam was earthy, and the second man is the Lord from heaven. Verse 49, as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now Christ is the heavenly image. Now what are we going to look like? Um, I think we ought to turn quickly to 1 John 3. And this, you cannot get around the explanation of God's Word or what we're going to be like. 1 John 3. Notice this about this sonship and about the family of God and about the Father and the firstborn among many brethren. This is all concluded in all what I've been telling you. Beloved, now in this present flesh are we the sons of God. We are already the sons of God in a begotten state. And it does not yet appear clearly 
but we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, when He comes for the second coming, Jesus Christ, we shall be like Him. Read Revelation, His eyes blazing like flames of fire, so intently that no human being could look Him in the face and ever lie to Him. When He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And every man that has this hope in Him purifies himself even as He is pure. Yes, we're to be living a pure and a righteous life as part of that achievement, that goal. Verse 50, I'll just read you this back in 1 Corinthians 15. Flesh and blood cannot enter the, uh, the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. I'm showing you a mystery. A secret that has been withheld from this world to this time. We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall be changed into a different composition. We shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, like snapping of a finger, we'll not all sleep or die, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and tells you at the moment it occurs, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. Or that's the end of us. That's the end of the whole thing, the whole plan. No. We read these obituaries. I do a lot because of my age. See if I'm, if I'm in there yet. <laughs> but no one goes to heaven when they die. This false belief. I don't care how many false ministers of Satan. I don't care how many obituaries state it that they've gone to heaven to be with the Lord. And I can't help it if it gives some of these people some sort of comfort to read these statements that their loved one has gone to heaven. It's still a lie, and I am not going to preach something that I know to be a lie. Now, I'm not going to blurt it out in their face. They're hurting. They need comforting. I'm not going to blurt that out to someone who's just lost a loved one. We're not to be mean to people, you might say, harsh. But anyway, they believe that and I can't help it. But again, in Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, I'll just read you this again for the time is running short. John 3.12 if I've told you earthly things, he told Nicodemus Christ, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I, t if I tell you heavenly or spiritual things? What good would it be for me to go out here and confront some poor ho hurting person in an event like that and try to cram something down his throat at that time of what the Bible teaches and what I believe because they don't understand it? They do not get it. Verse 13 Tells us, no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. I believe that's in the book of Acts. And verse Acts 2 and verse 34 says, David, the one who's going to be right under Jesus Christ, and that level, David is not ascended into the heavens, but he said that he would, uh, Christ told him to sit on my right hand until I make your foes your household. Now then, what is the time setting here? I'll have to quickly cover this. Jeremiah 30 and 7 was covered already by Mr. Schuster. Talks about the day of the return of Christ. Jeremiah 30 and 7. I'm going to read this for sake of time. I'm going to have to read it rush. That day is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. Yes, we've gone through the tribulation, put into captivity. The day of the Lord is occurring and it's going to occur around that time. And tells us he'll break the yoke off of this foreign conqueror off of our necks. Matthew twenty four twenty one shall be great tribulation, same time, such as was not since the beginning of up till this time. Talks about the resurrection of David finally in Ezekiel thirty four, verse twenty three, I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall and he shall 
Well, talking about David, even my servant David, he shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd, and the Lord will be their God, and my servant David a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken it. So this is all a part of the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the one that Christ preached there originally. Mark 1.14 uh, talks about in Revelation 11.15. I'll read you this one. The seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. We know from other chapters in Revelation that we will reign with Him, under Him, for a thousand years. And you know, if I had not had the real truth revealed to me a long time ago, what the Bible is all about, it would be difficult for me to believe that only a small, select group has had the great mystery of God open to their understanding. But God is going to fulfill His plan and His purpose. It truly, though, is the world's best-kept secret.